Thank you for joining us this evening for our Cumberland Family Academy workshop. Cumberland Family Academy is a Cumberland County Schools initiative. The Cumberland Family Academy is committed to enriching the lives of our children by bringing parents, guardians, and schools closer together as equal partners. When families have high expectations for children and encourage them to work hard, they support and promote a child's academic, social, and emotional well being. The purpose of the Family Academy program is to provide families with the necessary tools to support the success of their child's education. This evening, our workshop pre presenter is Natalie Godwin, where the topic is Reading is Fundamental Helping Your Child with Reading. Thank you, Wakenia. I'm really excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to meet last Thursday, but that daggone weather was just giving us all a hard time and our internet connections were just difficult. So thank you for joining us tonight for being flexible. My name is Natalie Godwin. I am one of the three K-5 ELA curriculum specialists for academic services. I am a product of Cumberland County School System. I grew up in Cumberland County Schools. I went to Sunnyside Elementary, then I went to Stedman Junior High School, which is now an elementary school, and I graduated from Cape Fear. I am also a proud FSU Bronco, go Broncos. We have a wonderful education system here in Cumberland County, and I'm so excited and happy to be part of this system. So let's go ahead and get started with our session for tonight. All right, let me see. Wakenia, oh, there we go. I'm not a master of Zoom, so if you guys hear me call out to Wakenia, it's because it's not playing nicely with me. So she's my tutor in the, in the moment. So as Wakenia said, we do have some objectives we're gonna to try to cover tonight. She gave you a brief introduction of the program, the Cumberland Family Academy. They've done an amazing job getting this kicked off this school year. Um, there is a workshop guide, which just talks about the basic guidelines for how to run an effective and efficient um, uh, session such as this. We're gonna talk a little bit about what it takes to have a literacy rich home, the power of reading aloud, and then bringing reading home, how we can make it fun and things that we can do with our students at home to increase their success as readers. Then we're gonna close it out with you guys to have the opportunity to ask questions that you might have related to your child's reading and things that maybe you're currently doing with them at home and suggestions that we can offer. So as she mentioned earlier, please make sure that um, your computer uh, is muted, that your microphone is muted during the end that you guys can communicate with us with your microphones. But if you have a question during the session, please make sure you drop it in the chat. Wakenia is watching the chat for us and periodically through this presentation, she'll pause or I'll pause and then she'll pose those questions so that we can address them in a timely fashion. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to have a literacy rich home. One of the things that we can do as parents to encourage our students to be readers is to practice reading at home daily as a family. Our students are constantly watching us. Your children are watching and emulating you even when you don't know about it, don't know that they're doing it. So making sure that your children see you enjoying reading and incorporating reading in your daily life is one of the best things that you can do as a parent to ensure that your child develops a love for reading. Think about the things that you have in your home that your children might see you reading on a daily basis. They might see you picking up a magazine. They could see you picking up picture books or chapter books that you might be reading along with them. We are um, still able to read newspapers if you pick one up at the dime store, but we also are reading our computer screens constantly. And so letting them see how we use reading every day in our lives to enhance what we are doing and to make us better citizens. If you do those things, you are well on the way to creating a literacy rich environment and a literacy rich home. Your attitude about reading is contagious. Believe it or not, the way that we feel about reading has a huge impact on how our children feel about reading. And one of the things I like to say, and we've said it before in classrooms, is sometimes you've got to fake it till you make it. 
you might not have had the greatest reading experience when you were a student. You might not have had the best teacher that instilled in you that love for reading. But you've got a unique opportunity as a parent right now of a child in kindergarten through second grade to help them establish that lifelong love of reading and creating an opportunity for them that's going to take them on a journey that they cannot even imagine. Reading is something that we do every day and we don't even think about it. When we are cooking, we're reading. We're reading recipes. We're reading recipe cards. We're reading recipes that we found on um, Facebook, things that people have shared with us. When we go to the grocery store and we're looking at the different items that we're picking up off the shelf, looking at the ingredients. When you think about the things that you're doing for your job or you're putting together um, a television stand or a desk, maybe some of you have been doing those things while your children have been learning virtually. All of those things have directions and have opportunities for you to show them how reading is something that we do every single day. I also encourage you to think about the different community resources that we have that can increase your child's love of reading. We've got some fantastic public libraries which have some wonderful uh, opportunities for students, elementary through high school. Get a library card, not just for them, but for you and go find a book or a, a, a video, something that will create an interest that all of you can share together. So what can we do at home to make sure that we make reading a fundamental part of something that we do every single day? We make it a routine. We establish a routine just like we have routines for other things in our homes. One of the things that you can do is select a time every single day that's designated Natalie, Natalie, your sound went out on us. Oh, did I go out? Can you hear me? Oh, you're back. We can hear All you right. now. I'm sorry, you guys. My internet connection is crazy. So I'm not sure where I was, but just talking about selecting that special time of day, making sure that we have established when are we going to read as a family. It could be in the mornings. It could be right after dinner. It could be before bedtime. It's also important that we're comfortable when we read because you need to kick back and get all cozy and make sure that you are in a, a physical state that encourages you to continue reading that text that you're reading. Also, it's really important, guys, to find a great book. You know, there's a book called Chicka Chicka Boom Boom and kindergartners read it in module one in kindergarten. And they read that book and they will read it over and over and over and over. Chicka, chicka, boom, boom. Will there be enough room? And the alphabet letters fall off of the tree. See, I see somebody smiling. They know that story. We as parents, we as adults might be so tired of hearing that book. But if it puts a smile on their face and they are excited about it, we want to encourage them to read. So sometimes it's not about finding something that we as the grown-ups are super interested in. It's about what is it that your child is going to be interested in. It's also important that we make sure that it's age appropriate, that it's not too hard, but it's also not too easy. When we're choosing books for our students to read, depending on what your goal is for that reading for the day, if it's a read aloud, it doesn't have to be a very simple decodable book. It can be a book that has a great story. Think about reading Cinderella for the very first time. A child most likely can't read many of those words, but they understand that story and they can retell it. So if you're reading something aloud, it can be at a level that they couldn't read because they are able to hear and comprehend. They're building those comprehension skills. And then don't forget to ask questions. That's where that comprehension skill is increased and built in students. We should be asking questions before we read, while we're reading, and after we're reading. So thinking about what's my book about? What are some things I want them to know? What do we see on the cover of this book? What looks interesting to you? Taking a picture walk and making predictions about what might happen in the story. It's setting that stage and getting your child 
interested and invested and you're hooking them into one of those things that's the love of reading. Reading and writing actually go hand in hand. Good readers tend to be excellent writers. We oftentimes don't think about it and it's oftentimes not really acknowledged, but when we are good readers, we are building a vocabulary. We're not just building a vocabulary that we see on pages, we're building a vocabulary that we then use to record the experiences of our lives. So that's where that decoding and that encoding go hand in hand. Some things that you can do as a family to encourage that love of reading and then incorporating it in writing is have lots of things that students can use to write, to record their thoughts. Not just pencils and paper, but things like paints and crayons and markers. Because writing is not just the act of writing a complete sentence and it being grammatically correct and looking picture perfect on the page. It's capturing those thoughts and ideas. And then we build upon those writing skills and those grammar components that we as adults are looking for. But we want to make sure that we have opportunities for our students to take those skills that they're developing as readers and add that to their toolbox of how to be a good writer. You wanna make sure that those materials that you've got available for them, the paper, the pencils, the markers, the crayons, the books, everything is stored where your students have access to it. You'll find that if kids have access, easy access to things, they'll oftentimes go and seek them out without needing you to assist them. And what an amazing thing to see your child go to the cabinet, go to the bookcase, go to the drawer that houses those fabulous tools to start recording their own story, making their own history. And then you also want to remember children can be easily discouraged. As parents, it's really easy to look for those things that we've already mastered. Well, we know how to spell the word cat. And we know how to spell the word was and that sentences begin with capital letters and end with punctuation marks. We don't want to extinguish the fire that a child has, a passion or an interest that they have because they haven't quite yet developed a skill. So when you're looking at what your child is doing, encourage them. Ask them questions. If there's things that you think they should have done properly that they haven't done, then talk to them about it. And then say, well, you know, I think I've seen you use that word before. Let's go back and see in, in the book that we've read or writing that you've previously done. We've got to make sure that we use kindness and positivity when we're responding to our students' reading and writing efforts. And then again, just as I said with the reading, let children see how you write every day. Writing has transitioned, not just from paper and pencil to using a keyboard, especially in the times that we're in right now with this pandemic, many of us have been linked to computers all day long. So thinking about how we use our computers to generate presentations like the one you're looking at right now, creating and drafting emails or posts that you're putting on Facebook. So let them see those experiences that you have as writers as well. We wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the power of reading aloud. Reading aloud with your child is one of the most important things that you can do to build a successful reader. We oftentimes think that reading aloud ends when students start gaining their own vocabulary. But truthfully, reading aloud is beneficial for our students kindergarten through 12th grade. Reading aloud takes many different shapes, forms, and fashions, but it is vital to building comprehension. As a, as a read aloud, what we're doing is we are modeling fluency. We're modeling what reading and good reading sounds like, what it looks like, what good readers do when they come across something that's unfamiliar to them and how we are persistent and we have endurance and we don't give up. So we wanna to talk to our kids about, this is what it looks like to be a good reader. And so this is what we call the I do as the parent. What is it that you can do? You're going to model for them what good reading looks like and what it sounds like. 
I have a link right here. I'm going to click on it. Why can't you? I have no idea what's going to happen or how to get back. But it's going to take us to an article. And I'm going to connect. I'm going to link all of these to a document that I'm sharing with you all. That's going to have things that you can do with your kids at home. But these are tips that you can use with your child that will help them become better readers. So reading more, asking questions, and it gives you some questions here. Before, while, after, pointing to words, like looking at specific vocabulary. And why is that word important? Why did the author choose that word as opposed to another word? How does that word make you feel as you're hearing it? And then the opportunity to reflect on a book. So we're not, it's not just a one and done. We didn't just read it and we're finished with it. So now what? And things like retelling it in our own words, giving a new ending to a story that we've just read or a story that is familiar and that we love. And then chicka chicka boom boom, revisit those favorite books again and again. Do the things that we need to do to make sure that our students are developing that love of reading. All right, am I back? All right, I'm so excited. <laughs> so we wanna move from the I do to the we do because we don't always want to be the one doing the reading aloud. We want to develop independent readers. And so we've got a model called I do, we do, you do. And we, we have an ebb and flow and we flow in and out of each one of those stages. So I do is when you as the parent are doing the reading and your, your child is doing the listening and the responding to questions. Then we can move into we do. And that's a shared experience between you and your child or your child and another sibling that they might have or a child and a grandparent. But that's when we're sharing the responsibility of reading together. And that can take many different forms. It could be something as simple as I read a phrase and then you echo it after me because maybe they haven't developed enough of a vocabulary yet to read the next set of words on their own, but we're building their capacity as readers by letting them echo after you. It could be that your child has developed enough of a, a reading vocabulary that they can read a part of the sentence and you read the next part. So we do a shared reading opportunity. But we wanna make sure that when we are doing that, we do, that we are honoring punctuation. We're giving those dramatic pauses where they belong. We're also using inflection in our voices because how terrible is it? And we've all heard those people before that sound like the McDonald's speaker. Wah, 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 wah. Nobody wants to hear that and nobody's gonna be listening. So you wanna make sure that you're using inflection in your voice, that you become the actor that you always wanted to be and you're doing it through reading. And I have another link here that I'm going to share with you, and it's got tips about how to do shared reading, because shared reading is something that we don't always do, and we may never have done it before as an adult. And so I've got a link here that's going to give you some tips on how to become a fantastic shared reader with your child, the benefits of it, and then things, strategies that you can use to increase the enjoyment of that experience. And then we want to finally move it into the you do. We want our children to, to become those independent readers. And now it's their time to take the spotlight, their time to shine. You're gonna to need to be really, really careful with this you do piece. You need to know a lot about your child and their independent reading level. This may be a time when you need to have some conversations with your child's teacher to find out a little bit about what Lexile they're reading at or what guided reading level. Lexiles are just a number that's assigned to a text and it goes from a zero or a beginning reader all the way up to above 1400. But groups, books are grouped in categories based on their level of difficulty. They also, there's also a range called level, Fontes and Pinnell's leveled reading and it goes A through Z. But if you go to your public library, when you go to a bookstore, they can assist you 
and selecting books that's appropriate for your child. A number one thing to get a child discouraged is to give them a book that's too difficult. They'll get frustrated and then they shut down. They don't feel successful. And that love for reading, we're slowly but surely extinguishing that candle. So we want to make sure that we've got that just right kind of book when we move into that you do. They're not always going to be the most interesting because as our students are beginning readers, they're going to be decodables. They're not going to have a great plot that you can ask a lot of questions about, but they're going to contain words that have lots of sight words. And they're going to have very simple decoded, decodable words that will aid them in their ability to apply that decoding skill that they're learning in class. We also want students to understand that we should never read most books one time. Now, once you get into chapter books, there are gonna be books that you love that you're gonna pick up again and again. But at, for our kindergarten through second grade students, we are developing that skill of being a good reader. We are learning to read. Once we move into third grade, third grade through 12th grade, we're reading to learn. That's normally where that shift happens. But when we're learning to read, Rereading a text two to three times is fantastic for a child because that's when they're developing that fluency. And you'll notice that on about the third time of a reading, your child's going to stumble less on unfamiliar words. There's going to be more of a flow, a rhythm to their reading. And that's because they have developed a comfort with that text and they're able to decode more frequently. You all have probably got a book at home that your child can just look at the pictures and tell you the story. And it's because that they have memorized it. They've heard you say it over and over again. Make sure that when you're having your child read to you, they're also making the connection that the word that's coming out of my mouth is matching the word that's on this page. So they're actually tracking along with that print so that they're not making up words. They need to know that the words they're saying align and match to the words that are on the page. I have a link here, which I think you guys are gonna love. And these are cards that you can print them up or you can just snap it open anytime you want on your computer. And these are question cards that you can use with your child before they start a book. Those are the green ones. And then in the middle of the book, you can ask these types of questions. And then once you finish the book, we've got these charcoal gray. But these are questions that you can use over and over. And you may want to just think about the book that you've read. And you might not want to necessarily use the question cards after the first read. That's another important thing to remember as students are learning to be good readers. Comprehension is not going to take place on the first reading. They are exerting all of their mental energy and their stamina on making sure that they're reading the words correctly. Comprehension doesn't take place at that stage. Comprehension of the story takes place in that second and third reading when I'm no longer having to exert all my mental energy on making sure that I make sure that the letters in this word make the right sound and that I can put them together to actually make a word that makes sense. So thinking about all these things as you're working with your student and moving into the you do. And again, as I said, we're gonna do ebb and flow from the I do, we do, you do. And you may flow in and out of those in the same day not necessarily switching from day to day. It just depends on what you and your child are doing and how the reading experience is going. Don't be afraid if you start noticing that something's not going well or that your child is struggling too much to jump back in and make it a we do. But what you wanna make sure that you do is that you don't constantly rescue your child because we want to develop that sense of independence. One of the things that we notice as children are struggling with reading is when they come to a word that's unfamiliar, they're going to ask their parent or their sibling or their grandparent, their guardian, what's this word? And then they want you to give them that word. And if you give them that word every time they ask you, what's this word? Then we are establishing a routine that when I come to something I don't know, I personally don't have the skills necessary to figure it out. I must need to rely on someone else. 
things that you can do are ask questions like, what's the first sound of that word? Get them to use the skills that they have in their toolbox. What's the first sound that that letter makes? Look at the first letter of that word. What sound does it make? Do you see any vowels in that word? What sound does that vowel make? Do you see any pieces of words inside that bigger word? So if I have the word F-A-T, well, I might not know what F-A-T is, but one of my sight words is at. Well, oh, I see the word at in that word. Well, what's the first sound? What's that first letter make? And then letting them see that they actually have a lot of skills that they don't always need to rely on us. Now, don't belabor it and don't let it take five or 10 minutes to try to figure out one word because that's certainly not going to increase a love for reading. But do encourage them to use the skills that they have to decode words that are unfamiliar to them. High frequency words. We all know them. Sometimes they've been referred to as sight words, the dolch word list, the fry word list, but they're those long lists of words that come home every year, kindergarten through first grade. And there's about 300 of them. Now you don't get all 300 at one time, but there's a lot of them. And you guys have seen them. They're flashcards and we usually give them out on beginner's day. So if any of you guys were kindergarten parents last year, you've seen those, those words. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make with sight words is trying to do too many too soon. So when you're working with your student with their sight words, their high frequency words, you wanna choose about five or 10 at one time. You also don't want to choose words that are super similar because these are words that most often cannot be decoded. They do not follow the rules of the English language, which by the way is a highly difficult language to maneuver as it is. We have lots of rules that can be broken in the English language. So with sight words or those high frequency words, many of them cannot be decoded. So the last thing we wanna ask them is, well, let's sound that word out. Nope, the word T-H-E is the or the, depends on where you're from, how you say it. But it's the or the, it's always gonna be the or the. We don't need to sound it out, commit it to memory. It's almost like learning your multiplication facts. You just need to know them. So that it's really a, 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 a drill type experience. Make some flashcards, work with your student on five to 10 words. Once I know those five or 10, add five more. And then make sure I still have those five or 10 and I'm working on the new ones. Eventually you'll be able to pull some of those words out and pull more in. But you never wanna get more than about 20 words that you're working with a child flash ever. It takes too long, it's frustrating, and it's really not a lot of fun. And remember, we want reading to be fun and we want them to enjoy the time that they're spending with you. Once you've cycled words out because you feel that your child has mastery of it, periodically pull those back in and make sure that they own those words, that those words belong to them. Did you know that if your child masters the majority of their sight words, that they can read most print that's put in front of them? You don't think about it, but if we look at a lot of the words that are on this screen right now, about 30 to 50% of them are sight words. So it doesn't take a lot of mental energy. I'm not having to exert my mental energy figuring those out. I can really spend my time on those new words that I'm unfamiliar with. We also wanna remember that high frequency words, knowing a word means you know it automatically. And that means when you show it, that teacher who said your child doesn't know this word because they couldn't do the drill test, the drill pack, if the child knows a sight word, they'll be able to identify it in three to five seconds that fast. When you look at a speed limit sign, it doesn't take you 10 seconds to figure out what those numbers mean. If the, the same holds get to a level of automaticity that as soon as they see it, they know what it is. When they can do that, that's going to increase their ability to be good readers. 75% of what children are gonna encounter in school in kindergarten through second grade is gonna be made up of those 300 sight words. 
75%. How much have we unlocked for our students if we give them the time that they need to work on those sight words? And I have linked here, and I'm gonna link it in the document that I'm sharing with you, the kindergarten through first grade list. And it's called kindergarten through first grade, but sometimes it will take students into second grade to master all of those words. This is a link that's gonna take you to the Cumberland County website, but it was pretty hard. The direct link to them. And when you click on these, there's five sets of them, the pre-primer, primer, and then level one, two, and three. You can print these out. You can make flashcards of them. You can simply go to them and write them on scraps of paper you have at home. You don't have to have access to a printer to make sight words for your child. You can write them on a dry erase board. You can write them on uh, an iPad and flash them to your kids. There's also many on programs available where you can do automatic sight words on your iPads or on your computers. You just can't control the words that they get as readily as you can if you make your own. So I would strongly encourage you to do that. But that link is gonna be available for you as well. And then we definitely wanna make sure that you and your child are having fun at home reading, becoming better readers and enjoying reading at home. Reading doesn't always have to be in a book. You can make games and puzzles and do fun things with your child that includes reading. You can enforce literacy through games like Lotto and Candyland by adding words to different game boards. We can encourage them to participate in readers theaters. There's all kinds of little plays that you can get or that you can print offline where each of you can take on a role and present a little play or a skit for your family. And as we're coming up on the holidays, um, regardless of what your choice of celebration is, there's all sorts of opportunities for families to get involved and have fun in drama. And there's lots of things available to you on the internet that could really make this a fun, exciting opportunity for your students. So I have this hyperdoc and it is linked for you in the chat while Kenny is gonna share with you again. A list of all sorts of fantastic fun things that you can do with your child at home. So I've got games like pocket rhymes and that's going to be working with rhyming words. It's very similar to a go fish. Memory. We all know how to play memory. You guys played it, but we were just matching pictures. Well, now they're going to match pictures, but, they're, but it's a rhyming picture. There's going to be a lot of different things here that your students can work with you on. Um, one of the things that I really encourage you to look at too is speedy phrases, number 11. We just talked about sight words. Lots of times our students will recognize words in isolation, but then when they see it in a sentence or phrase, it suddenly becomes unfamiliar to them. Speedy phrases is a way that we have, you can incorporate those sight words and going from one individual word to a three or four word phrase, which just increases their fluency as they are beginning developing those skills. As I said earlier, I'm going to add the links that are on the presentation on this document for you as well so that you'll have access to them. And know that one of the things I do as one of the K-5 uh, ELA curriculum specialists is we're always vetting new things and ways that we can improve the reading experiences of children. So I'm going to continue to add things to this document so that you can have this time with your child at home to increase their reading skills. So I've done a whole lot of talking and it took longer than I thought, but I wanted to end with this quote and I can't read it right this way. Let me get to it over here. All right, so the journey of a lifetime. There's so many places that we ourselves will never get to actually travel to in person, but if we take the opportunity to let our imaginations and our minds take us there. Books can take us to amazing places and can inspire us to become people we never thought we could become before. 
So I just encourage you to allow your child to experience reading through your eyes and with you and together go on this journey.